Thank you. Cinema can never get away. Go to my city, see, Dene, Dene, Ate. Publicly, some of you may know of my work that I did from various leadership positions in the Northwest Territories, including as the president of the Dene Nation, as cabinet minister, then premier. To recognize our people, I once stopped and helped stop a major pipeline. I was there to support the settlement of three regional land right agreements in our homeland in the early 80s to fight for our right to hunt and trap. I set up an international coalition of indigenous people, Alaska, Greenland, and all of Northern Canada. And to support the economy, I negotiated with the diamond industry to get jobs, contracts, access to diamonds right in our own homeland. I also, as Minister of Education, asked that there be mandatory curriculum so that the students of the North studied the history and culture of indigenous people years ago, made it mandatory. And when the Inuit asked for support to divide the Northwest Territories to create a new territory out of their own homeland, myself and many other leaders supported the vote on division and helped to negotiate a boundary that led to a successful and very, very mutually beneficial agreement on where that boundary would be. These are the things I have been involved in, but that's not what I came to talk about. I came to talk about leadership and my perspective on it. The most important part of my name, Gafi, comes from my grandfather. As a child, he saw in me what I could not see for myself, the leader that I was to become. And he coaxed leadership out of me through my life. And he was one of the first of many cherished elders that I've been close to. But you often hear us speak of elders. And what do we mean by that? Who are they and where are they? At first, all I knew was the words they uttered and gave to me. I could not appreciate or understand them very well but they stayed with me and they slowly came to life, clear, strong, enduring gifts. And their words have carried and sustained me through my life, in my various roles as a leader, and even in the times when I felt that I was truly alone. I was born on the land. For the first five years of my life, that's where I was. And then when I was nine years old, I was sent to residential school. And there I learned and was taught about the devil with terrifying pictures and people who look like me burning in hell. I was repeatedly beaten by a nun who told me I looked just like the devil. I was bad and I was dark. And this seared deep into me. And so for many years, especially as a young child, I often wondered if I, in fact, was evil. And so I carried this fear, this shame and rage into my life. And as a young, traumatized Dene, after I came home, I set out to confront what I saw as the enemies, the church, the government, the old companies. Now it was my turn to see them as evil, demons out to hurt me, out to hurt my people. And when I engaged them, and when I went out to meet and confront them, I referred that as dancing with the devil. So at the age of 18, I returned home from residential school. I was lost and angry. I turned to drinking, fighting, and once an older cousin scolded me and took me hunting. 
And he said, respect the hunters and the trappers and people who know the land. They know more than you ever will and what you learn at school. They took me out on the land time and time again, reconnect me to my roots and my culture. And as a young leader, I once stood at a large assembly, spoke eloquently, I thought, in English, and everybody applauded. And when I waited for my aunt to interpret for me, she spoke over the loudspeaker and said, you spoke so well in English, now you speak for yourself in your own language. And there was a long silence, and I started to speak. And I've relearned my language the hard way, you might say. <laughs> Another elder told me, I'm going to make you a drum when we find your voice. Then we will make the right drum for you. And it made me wonder if I had a voice worth hearing with something meaningful to say, words that could resonate. By the time I was 36, a husband and a young father fighting alcoholism, one of the Dana elders told me, try to connect to your heart and learn how to love. His words were my medicine, and my children and my wife taught me how to love. My grandfather was with me at that time too, years after he had already passed on, but was still a living presence in my dreams. He came to me and challenged me to stop drinking, to choose life. And so I did. A few years later, when I was out smoking a cigarette, I had to make that clarification. <laughs> my, my young children started crying and said, Daddy, don't smoke, we don't want you to die. And I remembered the words of my grandfather. And so I also quit smoking following that. Then there was a, a very defiant community grandmother who once told me, Nobody can touch us. We are of the fire carrier people. We are the ones who carry the fire. Her words were the beginning of a new image of myself, no longer the devil's child. So I learned to believe in myself, to believe in what I have, that out there is always a light. There's always a light to take forward, to pierce the darkness, to create hope, to show the way to lead. Our chiefs and our elders always said, be respectful to one another and to everyone else. Work together, and that way you can work with others and listen to our words. One particular chief was a role model for me. In our meetings, he would sit for days and listen from morning till late at night. And after two or three days, he'd finally stand up. And we all knew it was time. And he would say, I've been listening to you, every one of you. And now we have to make a decision. We have to come together and put our words and our thoughts and our hearts together so we can make a decision and set a direction for ourselves. And that served me all the years that I've been working as a leader. In spite of the difficulties I had with the church and the suffering that they've caused, I knew the elders and the leaders were devout Christians. The values that the Christian faiths have are compatible with the ones we had. And so when there was an opportunity, I worked very hard to bring Pope John Paul in 1984 to Fort Simpson and Northwest Territories. And when fog prevailed and he could not land, we persevered in 1987, we got him to come and actually make the visit. So our elders who were there could see him and connect with the head of the church that a lot of our people belong to. It was a gift. And when Pope John Paul came, he gave us the words, regret 
for the way that the church had treated some of us and that he recognized that we are a unique people with a right to determine our own future as nations on our own homelands. When I was 13, my grandfather gave me a prophecy. He said, you will make my name known all across this country. And I thought, my grandfather is getting vain. <laughs> I did not know at that time what he was saying. He said, be respectful and focus on what is in front of you and what needs to be done and pay no attention to what comes wandering by or what tries to distract you. Then he and my grandmother said, we will always be with you. Years later, in my 50s, I realized I was carrying his words deep inside me. Even when I was locked up in a dark room and sexually abused in residential school. I realized that I had never really been alone that he was with me and that helped me survive and move beyond those severe traumas to survive when so many others did not. I believe that the elders are our true leaders, the wise ones who choose to set light, hope, and good and to see it in everything that is created, all that is around us. I had been stuck seeing the devil as a terrifying force. But in the worldview of our elders, he was such a minor character that they gave him a mere mortal description. He is the one who must have burnt his foot when God put him in hell. <laughs> and so that is name in Dene, a kid's burnt foot. <laughs> For in spite of all the suffering that our people went through, and the elders, they always believe the creator has always been beautiful and all that he created. And there is no all-powerful devil in their world, beauty and good prevails. And this is a common indigenous worldview. A healer from a Cree nation, years ago when I was with my terminally ill brother, who had a year to live, told us, it's hard to ask the creator to give you more time when you are not using the time he already gives you very well. He said, I cannot give you more time, but I can teach you how to use what you have better than you are now so that you truly appreciate and use what the creator gives you every second, every minute. So you are truly ready you know how to live, then you're ready to die and go to the spirit world. I realized that I was never so much leading as being guided by the wisest of our people all my life. And I want to believe that this has helped me to grow perhaps into the role of an elder someday, soon I hope, with a gradual give of compromise, of compassion. I realized that in the course of my early battle so many years ago, I had a tendency to demonize too many of those I had to engage with. I realize now that many of them, like me, were just good people, misguided and lost. And with that realization, slowly, my own demons have disappeared as my image of, of others have softened. It is my own personal kind of reconciliation and it has grown out of the lesson of kindness and compassion given to me by the elders. And I say as I did to my wife, sometimes you have to get to know the darkness before you can truly love the light. Like all the elders now, I try to focus on the good in people. I know that things will not change without continuing effort, continuing leadership on all sides and at all levels. But the elders have said, we believe there is hope that there is emerging rays of light in a history we have all shared where there has been far too much darkness. And that all one day, all this that oppressed and denies 
my people will disappear and that all of us that seek to harm and burn, to, to burn and hurt each other will be made powerless. Recently, the Prime Minister committed to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And for me, that is one certain opportunity that we all have to try to seize and make the best of. For me, there is an image of collective reconciliation started, and it starts within deep inside each one of us. For we have to arrive at a time when we are treated as human beings in our own homeland, equal as nations on our own homelands, recognized for who we are, where we are, and treated truly as equals, for we are the first people of this country and a founding nation of this country. To get there will require true leadership from all of us. Thank you very much.